just send live. Let's try it. I can then see it. Okay. Ja, <laughs> You can't be seen there, so you should be back here. Sorry? Right. Yeah, like 30 seconds behind or something like that. So if you want to, yeah, if you want to see where we actually are, we have this one. This one is, is live. So if they have some sort of... Uh, I'm not sure what Okay. Okay, I think that was... Great! Welcome to this uh, Pi Day. Um, today we're going to hear a presentation by Tudor Rollett, who's uh, an associate professor in analysis and probability, probability theory. And we're going to hear some uh, uh, some music from Damiabius Band, who's here. And um, I'm not going to have a long introduction. I'm just going to say that this presentation will be about pi and pi-like numbers and their, uh, how they're connected to music. And uh, Julie will explain all about pi and pi-like numbers. And for those in the chat, if you, if you have any questions, just write them down and I will post them to Julie when, when there is uh, an opportunity. And you in the room, you just raise your hand and you will be, will be glad to, to answer them, right? Yes. Great. Course. Great. Okay. Thank the floor you. is yours. Thank you, Diana. Um, yes, so jag ska prata på engelska, men om ni har frågor, ni får gärna ta frågor på svenska. Och om ni vill jag förklara på svenska, det kan jag göra. So, um, but I hope it will be okay for everyone. I think your English is better than my Swedish. So, um, all right. So, probably you're familiar with the geometric meaning of the number pi, but you might not know that pi is actually inside of music. So, um, how does this work? The vibrating strings movement is found how that works and how pi will become involved with this map. 
Um, So Samuel just demonstrated vibrating strings, and we all heard them. Now, when the string vibrates, what happens is that vibration creates uh, vibrations in the air, which we don't see it, but the air is full of little molecules. And these vibrating molecules come and vibrate on your eardrums, and then your brain translates back into the beautiful sounds that we hear from the guitar. So these vibrations are described by a mathematical equation. So let's take a string and mathematize it. So we have a string, like on a guitar, and it can move up and down. And if we're thinking about A guitar string, when you play the different notes, you hold, so one end is held fixed, and the other end you hold fixed with your hands. So the two ends of the vibrating string, they don't go up or down. So to turn that into math, I'm going to introduce a function. So it's a function that depends on two variables, and this is going to be the height of the string at x units from the left. So I'm going to place one end of the string at the position zero, the left end, and then the string has a certain length, which I would call L. So the height, this function tells us the height at a distance x from the left. So x is going to then be a number between 0 and f. And we're not going to get concerned with what are our units of distance or time. Pick your favorite units. Okay? So the fact that these endpoints do not go up or down, we can express with equations. So the ends do not move. And that equation is the height when x is 0, so at the left endpoint, will remain 0 for all time. Similarly, the height at the far right endpoint will remain 0 for all time. But in the middle, the string can vibrate up and down. And so this function can be positive if the string is up, or negative if it's below, and identically zero if the string just isn't moving at all. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So, so we've now got these two equations, and we get, we've got a few more equations that we get from physics. So I see some students from physics who could explain to us the origin of this equation. Um, so this is a partial differential equation, and it's called the wave equation. And it says that the second derivative with respect to time is proportional, so this is a positive constant 
to the second derivative with respect to position. And this comes from the laws of physics. So it's simply if we hit a stream and it vibrates, then this function that gives us the height on the string has to satisfy this partial differential equation. And this constant C depends on the material that the string is made of and more or less how sort of elastic that material is and therefore how quickly the string will vibrate. So that's the wave equation, which is a partial differential equation. And then let me write down these equations right here. So at the left endpoint, my function is zero, and at the right endpoint, my function is zero. And this is called a boundary condition. Because if we think about it, this is what's happening at the two ends of the string, which are like the boundary of the string. And then um, there is some initial condition, so which is what is the position and the velocity along the string. time zero. So that is called an initial condition. So I can give you an example. So let's say we take our string and we pull it up. So the initial condition is the function length of the string divided by 2 minus the absolute value of x minus the length over 2. Okay, so you've pulled it up in the middle, the ends are fixed, and then you're going to let it go. So if we do that, this function describes that position, and if I'm holding it at time 0 and then let it go, what is the velocity at time 0? Zero, because I'm holding it. It's not moving yet. So then this function here would be just zero in our example. Okay? All right. So let's solve it. Now there are students in the audience who can tell us what we should do first. Some of these students are going to have an exam where they really ought to know this. Yes? So for the variables. Yes, separate the variables. Exactly. So I like to write this problem in this order. Because this is the order in which we sort of solve it. So we start at this first line and we separate variables in this PDE. So we look for functions that are of a special type where instead of, so in this function u of x and t, the x and t could be all interglommed up in some complicated way. But we're going to look for a solution where the x and the t are separated out. So it's a function of only x multiplied with a function of only t. And that's a little easier to deal with. One of the reasons you can see that is what do you learn first, single variable calculus or multivariable? Single. So single variable things are easier to deal with than multivariable things. So we substitute such a function into the PE, and we get the second derivative of the time function times the position function is equal to our constant squared times the time function times the second derivative of the 
position function. And now we continue to separate the variables, dividing by t times x, and we get the second derivative of the t function divided by itself is c squared times the second derivative of the x function divided by itself. So now, what can we conclude about the two sides of this equation? They're constant, but why? Because they have to be equal all the time, and they depend on different independent variables. So they both have to be constant. <coughs> And what do we usually call the constant? Lambda. We do call it lambda, yes. <laughs> Which is this Greek letter. Similar to pi. Pi is a Greek letter as well. So, which side do we solve for first? X. Y. Because the boundary conditions are in the X. Yes. Because the boundary conditions will help us to see what the value of lambda needs to be. <laughs> so we look for this equation first, which we also have these boundary conditions. Because in order to make a function zero at the ends, well, the only way to do that is if the position-dependent function is zero at those points. So the boundary condition goes for the function that depends on the position. Good, okay. So, <coughs> this turns into, this has a name actually, this is kind of a problem. This is called a so, SLP. This is, an SLP stands for stern weaville problem. And some of the audience has solved this many times, in fact. And what do we get? So we can tell you the only solutions, like all of them, are constant multiples. x is L, then these L's go away. And what happens to sine? Oh, I didn't tell you what N is. That might be a bit confusing. So N is a positive integer. So now I've sort of given it away because the sine function, remember, let's just write um, sine of x has a graph that looks like this, right? So what happens if you put in an integer multiple of pi to a sign? It gets zero. That's how we get this boundary conditions to be satisfied. So this is why we, we need pi inside these functions. So we find actually infinitely many 
of these position-dependent functions. And then they, we use them to feed them back and tell us what the time-dependent functions are. And they are certain coefficients times cosine of almost the same stuff, but here the C coming from the speed of the wave goes inside. So, and there are special numbers which are this value squared. Um, with a minus line. And these are called eigenvalues. And the set of all of them is called the spectrum. And essentially, these numbers encapsulate the sound of the vibrating string. Our solution is obtained by taking all of these pairs of functions that we found, and what do we do with them? Exactly. Superpos superposition just means addition and helps us to satisfy the initial condition. So we take all of these solutions we found and we add them up. That's what superposition means. And to complete our solution, we need to say what these coefficients are. And for that, the initial conditions will help us to find coefficients of functions that depend on time. So we use the initial conditions to find these a's and b's. are orthogonal bases of Hilbert spaces. <laughs> so essentially, many of you probably did some linear algebra. Um, or actually, we can just keep it real concrete and think about three-dimensional space. So we have three basis vectors for three-dimensional space. Um, in math, we call them usually E1, E2, E3, and in physics, you call them I, J, and K. And you can express any point or vector in three-dimensional space 
by projecting it onto these three basis vectors and then adding them up. Okay? We can do that with functions. So, how does it work? We project our function onto these, which are basis functions, just like you would with a vector. So you take the scalar product and you divide by the norm squared. And if you're curious what that looks like, it looks like these integrals. And then we can do the same thing for the derivative. If a slight change happens, because when you take the derivative, you have to apply the chain rule. And so this stuff inside the sine function comes out front. And so what we get here is n pi c over l b n x n of x. So the b n's are almost the same with the other initial condition. And for our example, these are actually all zero because the g is just zero because it's not moving. So for our specific example, if you calculate these, the a n is rather cute, eight l squared cosine of n pi over four times sine of squared of n pi over four divided by n squared pi squared, and the mean n is uh, zero. So now we have completely solved the vibrating string. And since we did this for a string of an arbitrary length, we have completely solved all vibrating guitar strings. And we are seeing that pi comes out. Oh. Here. So pi is inside these functions and it's also in these numbers which are called eigenvalues which the collection of is called the spectrum. So um, one of the things that's interesting is that the the, the um, since these are negative, if we look at them in absolute value, the smallest one corresponds to the fundamental tone of the vibrating string. And because these are square integer multiples of the smallest one, that gives the harmonics above a special relationship to the fundamental tone, which is one of the reasons that vibrating strings sound nice to humans. Interestingly enough. So this mathematical structure of these eigenvalues is part of the reason that strings sound the way they do. So with that, I'd like to introduce some other math um, professionals. Um, so we can listen to some more pot. So Let's listen to some more stringed instruments, as well as some other instruments. Um, so we have Klaus on percussion. <laughs> Matt on the bass. <laughs> Samuel on guitar. And Torbjorn on both vocals and trombone. <laughs> and let me adjust the camera here for everyone who's digitally with us. Here we go. 
And um, so this song actually also has a lot of pie in it because it's about circles that are tangential to each other, just touching at one point, um, which are called kissing circles. And um, the, um, <clears throat> the song is Kiss Precise, which is a poem by a scientist who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, um, Saudi, uh, in 1936, the poem was published. And actually, mathematically, this question of tangential um, circles or kissing circles is a two-dimensional version of a more general um, problem, which is called a sphere packing problem, which you can think of as asking, how many oranges can I fit in the box? But you might want to ask it for higher dimensional oranges, like eight or 12 or so forth, um, because this actually becomes relevant in physics. And the Nobel, or sorry, the Fields Medal winner, um, or one of the Fields Medal winners from last year, Marina Vyasovska, um, one of her great achievements was in solving the sphere packing problem in higher dimensions. So, mm. with this inspiration, take it away. There's a wish you kiss me, be. In false the trick of not a tree. This of soul will force her to feed. Each one of the three. To bring the sap before the sea. A three in one or one in three. A three in one be young or down. It's yet kisses from without for circles so the three will succumb The smaller of the tender That is just a deeper song The kisses from the center The break is on the floor of the As one through your Signs of zero sign of the corn For each to kiss me That's where all the song Oh, 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 Silence very calm affairs and also learn surveyor. My tribe of chess and all the yards. The spirit is much again. Now besides the pair of pairs, a future in the kiss you share. It's size of zero, size of the four. For each to kiss me out of the four. The spectacular of the sun. Of all of my friends, it's the sound of this weather. That's where all the sun and all of my friends, it's the
So. So there we didn't just hear guitars or bass or strings. We also had percussion and trombone. So you could ask, well, um, how we could ask the same actual same question. So how do those sound? And um, can we, can we solve the same kind of equation, but let's say to understand a vibrating drum? Trombone is a little complicated, so I think we'll just stick with, with the drum for now. And the voice. Pardon? The voice. The voice we can essentially treat the same way as strings because of vocal cords. Although if you wanted to get more complicated and take your string and consider it not just as a one-dimensional object, but with a cross-section, then um, the vibrating drum, you sort of combine it with the string. The cross-section being a disc, and then the length being like a string. So you can sort of put them together to get a vocal cord. So, I guess I'll save this one. Okay. So, let's now think about a vibrating drum. And let's think about a drum like this one. So, it looks like this. And the part that we that really is making the sound is the flexible membrane on the top, which vibrates. So this membrane vibrating disc-shaped membrane creates the sound. Okay. So now, if we want to describe the height at a point on the surface of this drum head at a time t, how many variables do we need? Three. Because we have to specify time and then position on the surface. And then the function tells us height. So again, a zero height will be it still, and uh, above will be positive, and the negative will be, uh, below will be negative. So I'll, I'm going to call the function u again. It's not the same u, but this is just how we usually write things. So it should satisfy the following equation. So I'm using polar coordinates, which I'll mention in a moment. And let's say our radius is capital L. So then the edges of the drum are held, they're connected to metal. And this metal is solid and it's not really moving a lot. So we think of the boundary as being fixed. So this is the boundary condition. So this is my wave equation. And then there will be some initial condition. Corresponding to the initial position and the initial velocity. And so polar coordinates, remember, are
R is the square root of x squared plus y squared in rectangular coordinates x and y, and theta is the angle whose tangent is y over x. Or you might think of them as the other way around, saying x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. So it's natural to use these coordinates because we're looking at a disk. And then this is what our wave equation looks like in these coordinates. So we can solve this. So basically, it's a similar process. You separate variables. And superimpose what we obtain. and tell you what the solution is. It's again a series, but actually it's two series. So I'm going to sum over all integers and over all positive integers, and then I'll have functions of time, time functions of the radial variable, times functions of the angular variable. And what are these constituents? So the angular component are complex exponentials. So i here is the square root of negative 1. And you could rewrite this equivalently using sines and cosines, but it already takes up enough space, and if I did that, it would take up twice as much space. So I use these because they're shorter. And then um, the These functions, the radial functions, um, they're special. They are called special functions. taking the absolute value of n because they are the same for plus and minus n. Um, so it's the special function of order absolute value n, and I'll, I'll tell you more about those in just a moment. And then last but not least, and I'll tell you about these pi's. You see I've used the letter pi here, but this isn't pi. These are, these are, these are relatives of pi, which, which I'll tell you about in a moment. These time-dependent functions are multiples of sines and cosines. And 
And for this problem, these eigenvalues are now minus pi nm squared over L squared. So I should tell you what these pi's are. So pi is a special number, but there are actually lots of special numbers in math, and there are lots of special numbers related to how things sound. And these are some. So the best thing function is Jn here, I wrote. So I can, for any n, positive or negative, this function is a series that looks like this. It alternates to the end of K. And it's divided by some factorials. So let's compare it to the sun. Has a similar expression. Right? So this it's called a Bessel function. Is a relative of the sine function. And it has certain properties in common with the sine function. For example, its absolute value is less than or equal to 1. And it also has a similar looking Taylor series. And moreover, its graph looks like this. And what are these pi's? So as before, we needed functions to be zero representing the boundary not moving. So here we need functions to be zero representing the boundary of the drum not moving. That's precisely what these are. So this is pi, say, n1. It's the first place where this Bessel function is zero. And then this is the second place. And this is the third place. And there are infinitely many places where these functions are zero. And these places are special numbers. And, ah, right. Bessel functions are lots of fun. Their zeros describe a vibrating drum. And so these zeros of the Bessel functions are the reason why a drum like this one sounds the way it does. <laughs> there are many open mathematical questions about these numbers. So I think they're actually, we have some number theorists in the audience. Are they always transcendental, all the zeros of all the Bessel functions? Not sure. I think in some cases it's known that the pi is not a rational number, it's what's called a trans, and it's not the, um, it's not algebraic either, it's something weird called transcendental, which sounds really neat. So these are often also transcendental, but whether or not they're always transcendental, um, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure if anyone in the world is sure. So unlike the sign where you find the first zero, and then all the remaining ones are just 
nicely spaced along. I, we can say how they're sort of asymptotically spaced, but they don't have really, they're not like always the same interval between them. It's a little bit more chaotic which maybe explains why the sound of a drum is a little bit less sort of clean than the sound of a, of a string. Um, but I find it fascinating because these numbers are the reason drums sound the way they do. And um, more generally, we could set up a problem for the trombone, which would be quite hard because what we have to do, as you've seen, is we solve uh, the wave equation in a certain geometric context. And the more complicated the shape, the more complicated it is to solve. That's a complicated shape. It's beautiful, but it's complicated. So, find these eigenvalues, or the spectrum, which is all of them, in different geometric contexts, or geometries. So this is my area of research. This is my main area of research. Uh, it's called spectral geometry. And I'm only one of um, a group, or several researchers, um, here at Chalmers and GU, who look at these types of problems. Philip, it even comes up in your work. We've talked about this. And um, perhaps some others who are here occasionally look at spectral problems and geometry problems. Um, so it's an active area of research, which I think is super fascinating because it combines elements from physics with these partial differential equations with analysis, as you've seen, solving these equations, and then also bringing in shapes and geometry. So that's going to tie us into the next song, where we can hear the sounds of these geometries. And the song itself is also about an interesting geometric um, phenomenon. So a regular old triangle, what do the angles add up to? Which today is pi, right? What about a triangle on, if you have a sphere and you make a triangle that's sitting on the sphere? That's what the song is. Om maar met de rindwiaken zo vrijes, denk ik zo maar één te vrijes. Al die samenmannen om maar kan kruipen, als je wat eet dan kan die gaan naar elkaar. Rustig schijnen, de eerste op dat, de zakken het dan zo'n goeie dwaar. Ja, rustig schijnen, de eerste op dat, de zakken het dan zo'n goeie dwaar. De meeting van jou van de kraan, de meeting van jou van de kraan. Ich habe Oh, 
jumped up on the script of the room Feeling small and ran the room And the street and the smell of just loot Over me, over me, over me, over me, over me And this is the shame, it's so bad The stuff that it don't so go too bad And this is the shame, it's so bad The stuff that it don't so go too bad And this is the shame, Thank <laughs> you. 